Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to the Fifth Estate at the Wheeler Centre. My name is Sally Warhaft, and it is a great pleasure tonight to have Jeff Gallup and Peter Harcher here with us uh, to talk about politics and public policy in Australia and the world. Uh, and look, this came about, I suppose, uh, with a feeling that I've had for so long now that Australia just seems, on the one hand, so close to greatness, uh, and on the other hand, so close to collapse. Uh, and that feeling of collapse is the one that's growing in me in recent times. Uh, and I'm anxious to know if uh, I'm going mad, uh, and whether it's the ideas or the political culture uh, or the contest, what is it that's caused this sense of decline? Um, and I also, another thing that happened was I recently admitted on this stage that I've got to the stage where I'd be happy now uh, if I saw each new government simply uh, get elected and solve one problem. And the audience were really sad for me. <laughs> uh, so I thought I, I better uh, get into it a bit more. Jeff Gallup is, of course, a former Premier of Western Australia. Uh, he was a Labor Party member in WA for two decades, from 1986 to 2006. And since retiring from politics, uh, I think he's been just as busy from the sounds of things. He's worked for Sydney University as Professor and Director of the Graduate School of Government, and he currently serves on numerous boards and committees. Uh, he's an Emeritus Professor at Sydney University, an Adjunct Professor at Curtin University's Institute of Public Policy, and since 2008, a Companion of the Order of Australia. So a very warm... Warm welcome, Jeff. And Peter Harcher is, of course, the political editor and international international editor of the Sydney Morning Herald, a Gold Walkley Award winner, former foreign correspondent in Washington and Tokyo, a visiting fellow at the Lowy Institute for International Policy, an author whose latest book is The Sweet Spot, How Australia Made Its Own Luck and Could Throw It All Away, which just ties beautifully into my <laughs> sense of anxiety. Um, and uh, Peter, welcome back to the Wheeler Centre. Um, I want to start with a little quote uh, from a conference that was held uh, at a university in June. And Peter Varghese, the former head of the Department of Foreign Affairs, said this about policy. We've gone from the days when good polit policy was good politics to virtually the opposite. It's not that we're on no man's land, but many of the organising principles that have sustained our positions, those organising principles are looking tattered. So I'd like um, each of you first, and we'll start with you, Jeff, to give us a sense of what the organising principles which create good policy and turn it into good politics, what, what, what they are. How is it supposed to work? Well, I think it's important that there be an overall strategy for the nation that's, uh, you know, at the core of government. It's, go it's going to be very, very difficult to get good government, I think, if there's not a sense of purpose about what the frame is in terms of the economy, the society, the environment and the political system itself. And, and I think Back in the 80s and 90s, there was a sort of a sense in which there was a notion of a national strategy. Uh, and I think in more recent times, we're he we've become heavily divided uh, as a nation and there's very little consensus in the system. So there's that background factor. Then if you look at the institutions of government, the adversarial nature of the politics, which reflects these, uh, these divisions that exist and the lack of consensus, have meant that the institutions like, for example, the Council of Australian Governments uh, Reform Council set up in, in the Rudd-Gillard uh, years to try to bring the states and the Commonwealth together in a much more constructive way, that's been ditched. So there's no longer any chance for people to get together 
as in an important context like that to develop uh, a strategy. Then thirdly, of course, it's the, it's the energy and drive of conservatives in Australia to block uh, one way in which you might conceive of a strategy for the country, which would be a reform strategy, some economic reform, environmental reform around climate, obviously important tackling some of the inequalities that we now know exist in our society and that are certainly unacceptable. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a very powerful resistance uh, to, to that. So I think, first of all, you know, the nation's not as united as it might have been back in the, the 90s. We're divided on some of these fundamental questions. There's not enough institutions where people can actually talk together. Parliament's supposed to be it, but Parliament is, is very adversarial. And then thirdly, we've got an extremely strong rump. I don't think it represents a majority, but it's a very powerful... And we, I suppose the last time we were very optimistic as a nation was when the Republic was being debated. And, and we saw the hostility of the opposition to that, and now we see that the opposition to tackling climate, uh, the opposition to really getting serious about uh, building a more a fair and equal society, the opposition to you know, having a, a better form of politics with more involvement of people, etc. So I think Australia is, is not in a good spot. Um, we might have had a sweet spot there briefly, but since then, no chance for consensus. Business community, they don't seem to get that equity is just important as efficiency. The organised working class don't like the business class and, and they're fearful of change, but they don't actually represent most workers in Australia now anyway. Small business is keen to have uh, you know, regulation from above to protect their interests, but they don't like any regulation from below from environmentalists or workers. And then there's these culture wars which are splitting uh, our system, not only across the parties, but within each of the parties. So marriage equality looks like an impossibility in Australia because of that. And, and there's just no consensus. That would be my, my central point. I wonder how much of that is new. Um, just for a sense of perspective, mm, yeah. for example, um, we had a constitutional crisis in this country in the 70s um, when uh, Malcolm Fraser blocked supply, Governor General sacked, sacked an elected Prime Minister. It's hard, I would suggest, it's hard to argue that we are in a greater sense of political or national crisis than we are then. So just, just to put things in a bit of perspective, um, I don't think it's time to slit our, <laughs> slit our wrists yet. The, the systems, the institutions that have produced really good uh, outcomes for this country are still in place. And the organising principles, to answer your question, are the same ones. Representative democracy, uh, informed by strong public service institutions, strong sets of independent institutions, the separation of powers, free speech and a vibrant media. These institutions, now, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's it's commonplace, it's, it's fashionable to pick up on the media and the 24-hour media cycle as the culprit, and we can cert ha certainly happy to talk about that. But the big picture uh, structures of the system haven't changed. Uh, what I would say uh, has changed is that the quality of the political class, and, the, and one of Jeff's phrases, you talked about purpose. Uh, you, ha you have to have uh, a political class with, with quality and a government and or opposition, preferably both, with a sense of, a sense of purpose, uh, a reason that they're there, rather than uh, to just to get the media exposure, uh, to, get the, to get the paychecks and uh, retire happily. So I would, I would ask what's happened to uh, the political class? Um, why is it that those same systems and structures have produced such a different outcome? Uh, and um, I just point out on your very opening line, Sally. There was a the, the uh, former BBC correspondent in Australia, Nick Bryant, a few years ago published a book. Mm -hmm. It's called "The Rise and Fall of Australia," and he said the stronger and more resilient Australia's economy has got, the worse the behaviour of its political class has become. I, I I would take you up, Peter, on the Whitlam example because I actually think, funnily enough, 1975 crucial incident in our history reflected upon, we can reflect upon its implications for our constitution, etc. But actually there was a lot of continuity between Whitlam and Fraser. Uh, so there was actually a consensus then, if you like a sort of a moderate liberal sort of consensus. Human Rights Commission, 
just to give one example, well, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps instituted. you had some, some policy consensus, yeah. but you certainly didn't uh, have a political consensus, nor did you have the conventions to prevent uh, the sort of national crisis we saw, as a result of which, since then, both major parties have developed a, 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 um, the orthodoxy that they will not block uh, supply of a sitting government. So that was actually actually uh, uh, reflected a flaw in the practices of our politics, yeah. and it's since produced uh, voluntary codes by our major parties to overcome that. I, I want to take up a couple of more points from uh, each of you. Um, Peter, you talked about uh, the strength of representative democracy, the strength of the institutions that surround it. Um, it doesn't feel, and it is not, representative. Our parliament is simply not representative of our population, and that, and and people uh, feel that. I, I I think, and I think your newspaper uh, would reflect that that feeling uh, as well. And the example you gave out of the strength of the institutions. I wonder how much things like the relationship, say, between government and academia has weakened. Uh, and where universities themselves are weakened because of bad policy uh, and is no longer coming back feeding into government, whether there are channels that used to be stronger such as that that no longer are. Well, I don't have a, a clear view on that. Jeff is better informed on that. Well, I, I think... In terms of the, uh, the you just remind me your about whether the, the the strength of the institutions that Peter outlined yeah. as a strength that you know in the in the argument that not as much has changed as we think whether some of those relationships that used to really inform good policy um, obviously you know public service academia yeah. whether they've been weakened well I think the the whole concept of representation now poses a challenge. The idea that we can elect from amongst, uh, you know, the different parties to, to to form a government, I do think we need some new institutions to liven up our democracy, and I'm I'm personally keen to see more use of citizen juries and citizens assemblies on some important issues, to give to give people the sense in which they can have an involvement as well in the decision making, randomly select people, have a proper deliberation. We could do that on on a lot of important issues. There have been recently, as you know, they've done it in, in Ireland in respect of their constitution, which led to the referendum, which led to the uh, marriage equality uh, uh, legislation in that country. So I think uh, our institutions are a little bit, I think, we've become a bit complacent about their strength. Uh, and I would argue that, that we've fed enormously off the China boom. We've had a lot of revenue coming in. Uh, it's, it was all too easy for a long time to patch over some of these uh, d d divisions that we have in our society. But now that they're sort of bubbling up and we don't have the revenue to be able to uh, you know, meet all the demands as we find with each of the budgets that we might like, we're going to need some new institutions to bring some strength and trust back into the system. And I think one of those uh, would have to be a, more wi a wider use of citizens' juries and citizens' assemblies so that people can see that, that the system's responding to some of the concerns they're expressing because currently they're just responding by voting for, for independents, minor parties, and I'm not, I'm not you know, knocking those people because they're up there in the process having a go, but I really don't think... They tend to take the word no into the political debate. I'd like a little bit more on the yes question, yes to broader reform. And what we're some, getting is no all the time. And there's some interesting work going on on that. I mean, it, it, there is agitation happening. Yep. Luca Belgiorno Nettis. Um, I yep. can't remember the name of his... New Democracy. New Democracy, yeah. He, uh, this is of the uh, Belgian Netta's Transfield dynasty, he puts up a lot of money of his own money and he offers to run for uh, councils or state or federal governments, citizens' assemblies, to inquire into particular policy issues. For example, uh, if, the, the, if uh, he's offered um, uh, the federal government to get a citizens' assembly, you'd get uh, 50 average citizens get them briefed by experts, give them a weekend uh, in a retreat type setup where they read, read uh, briefings and get expert advice on the electoral system, for example, how it works. And he, he's happy to bear the costs. Uh, the committee, the, the citizens feedback a report to the body that's 
that's commissioned it, whichever government committee or government department it is, and that's then fed into the policy process. Mm. And that has had, has had some uh, only a few well, Geelong, early wins, but Geelong it's, local it's government happening. recently. It's a great is, idea, but, it's I, isn't it? but I also I just hear that and I think we don't even think of our elected representatives as citizens anymore because that's <laughs> what they're meant to be doing. <laughs> that's right. And now we're having to outsource that. I, I, I have a theory. I have a theory about 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 what's happened to our political class, by the way. But I'm not going to force it on you. I will no, tell no, you if you please, want to know. Please, please. Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> I think, I, okay, so um, Peter Costello, I think, was the last politician, federal politician in Australia to check the urge to lash out and challenge his leader and bring him down. Ever since, ever since politicians on both sides, their ambitions run rampant, they're constantly restless, there's a pointless churning, uh, they see no constraint uh, on, on lashing out in any way they see fit. And this is, this is, uh, this is not unique but in such a fevered, concentrated, non-stop way, this is new. And my theory is that, um, so by the time John Howard came to the end of his time as Prime Minister, Australia had already hit the longest continuous period of economic expansion uh, on record, 12 years. Um, now, it may be coincidence, but he then became the first Prime Minister to be thrown out at a time of unequivocal economic growth. First time since World War II. That's, you know, that's interesting, that's suggestive. Uh, but that was the first time. And then it happened, it happened again uh, and again. So uh, what my, my suspicion is that um, the, the Australian public has decided that economic uh, growth is a standard, permanent, fixed condition, mm. which is no longer dependent on politics, government or policy. Therefore, governments can be treat, treated in, in, a much, um, in a much more offhand manner. The politicians have found this liberating. Mm. The politicians have said to themselves, well, if you guys aren't expecting us to perform in any particular way, bugger it, we're not going to. We're just going to indulge ourselves. Uh, and I want to be leader, and I don't, I don't, I'm not going to wait. And then the whole, the whole circus mm. uh, just took off. From the moment that shoulder, the, that, that knife went in between Kevin Rudd's shoulder blades, there's been a feverishness in both parties, which continues to this day, and you see it now playing out again with Abbott and, and Turnbull, and it's not going to end there. Uh, that is fascinating. Poor Peter Costello. All he does is get criticised for not uh, <laughs> taking the job, but in fact you've cast a different light on it. Uh, <laughs> I, um, I mean, the, the, the economic... Uh, line that you've so eloquently talked about. That in itself, though, is such a deep part of the policy problem, isn't it? That uh, this myth that the good times will more or less always remain, mm. and so every government relies on that to basically lie about everything, about forecasting, about budgeting mm. into the future, the way they project their budgets, but also about... In protecting uh, people from uh, what may not be good times, and is it is that in itself is it impossible to get good policy Look, I, when you've just got a big economic lie at the start of it? I, I think the way I would describe it all is there's no consensus. There's a lot of argument. There are big issues, big issues. You know, the climate issue. Uh, the nature of our society, the international uh, questions, etc., and and people are feeling around for something. And and if you look at our history, someone somewhere has to take a risk. Um, Whitlam took a massive risk vis-a-vis -vis the Labor Party of which he was a member back there in the 60s and said, we've got to change, we've got to lift up. And of course he had a bit of a battle and, and got there in the end, did his thing and then moved on. Uh, <laughs> What, 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 well, it, there was a lot of his policies were continued, you know, even though he lasted only three years in, in, in office. He took a risk. No one at the moment is willing to take a risk. Labor's not willing to take a risk vis-a-vis -vis some of its heavily, uh, you know, the, the heavy headed unions that back up the party. The Liberals aren't willing to take a risk on the Conservatives that are in their ranks. Uh, they're, all, they're all too nervous to take it. But when someone does that, and says, well, look, you know, your interests have got to go down a little bit here because the nation needs this, but your interests perhaps will go up a little bit here because we do need more renewable energy or conservation or whatever. Uh, I, think, I think they will come through. 
Look at Europe. Macron, where did he come from? He just all of a sudden emerged. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about his policies, but the Socialist Party went down to about 8% or something of the vote. Um, I think that's a, that's a description of what's going on, I think. If someone would take a risk like he took in out by the Liberal Party or the Labor Party, I think they'd get a lot of dividend politically. Uh, just a little brief aside from your, your theory. I'm going to spend weeks, months chewing over it. Uh, but is, is Turnbull in real trouble? You said it's going to happen again. Is it going to happen soon? Oh, it's under you, 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 of yeah. course, predicted the US financial meltdown in a book before just about anyone. So I'd like to know what else you think is going to happen. Uh, um, well, thanks. Um, well, it's underway. The, the, the Abbott uh, uh, assault on Turnbull is underway. Uh, people say, look, that's crazy, you know, Abbott's never coming back, the guy's an idiot. It, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that you've got um, a bloke in there with ready access to the national megaphone who, who is uh, burning up uh, with rage at the treachery and humiliation that he suffered at the hands of Malcolm Turnbull. It doesn't matter a whit that Malcolm Turnbull suffered the same tre treachery uh, that, at, at Abbott's hands as opposition leader. That doesn't matter. Um, so Abbott now is exactly as Rudd was, consumed with that rage, and he's going to act on that until he has destroyed Turnbull. Um, he probably can't get back to the leadership. Uh, that would be a bonus, but to, to him I don't think it's material. The material fact is uh, to destroy Turnbull. And uh, as we know, as we've seen played out before, a determined insurgent in the ranks, especially a former leader with a huge profile and, and access to the microphone at any time, can dominate the media, dominate the political cycle, rob the leader, the Prime Minister, of attention, of oxygen, of initiative, uh, endlessly and may not be able to win, but he can certainly destroy. And that's the course that he's now set on. Charming. Uh, <laughs> Jeff, That doesn't it, seem rational, does you've, it? You've, from a, yeah. you, well, no, and you know, as the person on the stage who has been a leader, yeah. uh, a, a premier, and at cl close quarters to uh, prime ministers, is power that great? <laughs> well, as, as, uh, when, I, when I said I was going into politics, one of my friends in Western Australia was a man called Senator John Wheldon. You may remember him. He said, first rule of politics, never assume rationality. And uh, it's good advice. It, it's, it's good advice. Look, it's very interesting uh, to reflect upon this concept, this beautiful Greek concept, hubris. It's a wonderful concept, you know, overweening pride that, in, that leads to inevitable tragedy. And, uh, you know, we're getting a fair bit of it. And uh, Peter's first point was a very interesting one, how, you know, you would think that if someone's in politics, they'd have the big picture that their party represents forces that are going to create a better future for everyone, and they've got to show a bit of discipline to make all of that happen. But it would appear that, that, that you know, interestingly, in our current context, you know, personal ambition runs ahead of that sort of what we would think is a rational view about their party, the Liberal Party versus Labor, to achieve an objective. And why is that? I, I just, I come back to my point. I think everyone's uncertain. Uh, everyone's sort of not sure what to do. And therefore, they feel desperate. And therefore, Abbott sees no choice but to have a crack at the uh, power again, as, as Peter's describing, or, or Rudd did the same with Gillard. Um, until we settle it down and get a sense of purpose around a, a party with a leader committed to that sense of purpose that's willing to challenge his own ranks or her own ranks and willing to you know, go to the community with a big picture story, I think this sort of thing's going to continue. And in fact, it won't solve anything. That's the bottom line. That's where the irrationality comes in. I've, I've never been in a position of power, Sally, but I've got some observations on the subject. It's got to be addictive. Mm. Um, 30, I think it's about 36 countries in the world have term limits on their national leaders. Yeah. This tells you immediately that there is a natural tendency among humans yeah. with power to hang on too long. Mm. Um, the second thing is some of our primate cousins uh, actually show physiological manifestations of uh, the, 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 um, the effects, the, the, the simple uh, 
uh, overpowering effects of power. So the silverback gorilla, for example. Uh, you know, the, silver, the male silverback doesn't develop the silverback until he's an adult. Uh, but in situations of these tribes of gorillas where um, the leader, the, the adult male, uh, meets a premature death, one of the uh, junior males will step in and take the leadership. And even before he's at an age where the silver would normally manifest, he develops the silver back by dint of the fact that he's now the leader. So you don't have to look far for, wow. for, for evidence <laughs> That there must be something pretty great about this power business. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and it's also, it's also the genius of a system like ours that has the separation of powers mm. where we have a court system that can check a government exactly. and all the other checks and balances, a bicameral system and all the other checks and balances, free speech and a free media, mm. because uh, power is, is addictive. Mm. If the audience is interested in that concept, uh, Dr David Owen, the former British Foreign Secretary, you might remember he's a medical doctor, is now very interested in, in this, this concept of hubris, you know, overweening pride, uh, as being linked, as, as Peter's just described it, to the having power. And he's actually written a, an academic article along with a professor in the United States arguing that this sort of political hubris is a form of mental illness. And, and seriously, I mean, they've, as you know, antisocial personality disorder, narcissism and whatever, and, and they've plonked it in there along the, alongside those. And there's no doubt power is an amazing force. And, and you know, those that, that have it, I think, have to constantly, you know, have some self-awareness, have mentors, have people who are willing to say, you know, you're going too far and pulling back, keeping in touch with people. Uh, it's part of the important uh, vocation that is politics. And uh, there are ways in which you can check it. You've got the institutions Peter talked about, but within your own work that you do, I think humility is very important. And without humility, hubris just sort of takes over very easily. Um, it, let's uh, get a little bit more positive, at least for a moment. <laughs> and uh, I did, I'm, I'm having to push myself to do this because I wanted to just delve deeper into that. But I'd like each of you to tell us um, an example of a beautiful policy. Uh, from its uh, the idea to its debate and inception uh, and the politics of it, something that was implemented really beautifully. And Peter, would you like to go first? Well, I'm thinking of one that relates to the whole purpose of being a, a rich, successful economy, which is to provide better services for your citizens. But I'm also thinking of an example of how you pay for that Am I allowed to if I'm quick? Yes. Uh, the one about providing better services. I'm glad you've got to. <laughs> that's great. Sorry. Well, that's right. You, that's right. You have to scratch around a bit. But um, we complain that there's uh, not enough bipartisanship, that there's too much, you know, bitchy, scratchy, nasty, pointless bickering. Um, this country created the National Disability Insurance Scheme uh, when both parties came together and agreed that we were a country that had the resources and the opportunity and the ability to deliver a national disability insurance scheme. Uh, that isn't yet fully realised. It's only in pilot stages running, as you know, across the states. But fully realised, that should be um, a revolutionary improvement uh, for the lives of millions of, of Australians. And that was a bipartisan achievement. Um, Bill Shorten should take credit. Uh, Rudd gave him that. Rudd was Prime Minister. Shorten was um, uh, Disability Services Minister. Uh, Rudd's motive for giving it to him was that, A, he thought it was an interesting idea, and, B, he wanted to keep Bill Shorten busy so he wouldn't scheme. <laughs> <laughs> it was partly successful. <laughs> we got an NDIS. Shorten developed the idea. The Liberals embraced it. Uh, um, Abbott embraced it. And it's now, it's now in the process of coming mm. together. There's one. Mm. Um, another one... Um, which was not bipartisan, but has ended up being the settled bipartisan policy of the country, was um, uh, Peter Costello again, the GST. Uh, he set the GST at 10% uh, under Howard. They knew that future governments would be tempted to raise it, and that was one of the biggest uh, attack lines on it. It's starting at 10 now, but soon it'll be 12 and a half, then it'll be 15, soon it'll be 25. Look at Europe, it'll get out of control. So they built in a mechanism where, as you know, 
Uh, the rate can only go up if all the states agree. States and Commonwealth have to agree. Um, and there are other checks in it as well. And it's been marvellously effective. It's still 10%. Uh, and, and we needed, you need a revenue base. If you're going to pay for new services, if you're going to have a civilised country, um, who was it who said that uh, taxes are the, are the entry price to civilisation? You have to have revenue and you can't go around pretending all the time that governments can only cut taxes. That was a successful reform. Uh, uh, it was needed. They put in a self-limiting device. That's been a successful piece of policy. I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd call it beautiful, but I think the two go well together. That, uh, yes, I agree. And uh, I mean, both incredibly, uh, hopefully in the future, of course, the NDIS will be as successful as the GST has been. The remarkable thing about the GST is that it was a much harder sell, uh, not politically to each other, uh, but to the public, mm. this idea of this tax. That, that to me, was uh, th that ability uh, to, you know, uh, to sell any idea at the moment seems uh, to have really waned, doesn't mm -hmm. it? The idea of explaining to people in adult language uh, you know, what what they need and why yeah. and convince them that something that seems bad to them will be good. Jeff. Well, I'm tempted to say the Gallup Labor <laughs> government 2001 to 2006, but I'll... <laughs> I'll uh, Can you be more specific? I, yeah. <laughs> um, look, I, I, thinking about... There's an issue down here in Victoria at the moment, and I think I could refer to a very good case study in my now home state of New South Wales, and that is the medically supervised injecting centre in King's Cross. Uh, heavily contested when it was originally proposed. Uh, a lot of argument in the community. Uh, Bob Carr, uh, following the drug summit, gave it his imprimatur. Uh, it was uh, originally going to be managed by the uh, sisters, but a certain archbishop made that impossible. Uh, and then the Uniting Church came in uh, to run it with government funding. What's beautiful about it is that it's, and I declare an interest here, my wife was the founding director, um, beautiful clinical uh, policies, very well managed, all controversial public uh, administration, public policies have to be well managed. That's why we need a good public service. Uh, very well managed. Uh, the government continued to articulate support for the program, even though there was a number of requirements that it be uh, tested over time. It was a pilot project for some time. Uh, the Liberal Party came in on side eventually, or despite the fact that initially quite a majority of the Liberal members opposed it, but Barry O'Farrell in the election came out in support. Baird continued that support. And now what's happened in that area of Sydney, of course, is a transformation uh, in terms of public amenity, in terms of the safety of injecting, so lives that would have been lost are no longer lost. And of course, I think uh, we can all feel better as a community. We can all feel better as a community that some of those most marginalised and vulnerable people in our community are given some priority so that there's more safety attached to their uh, lives. And, and, and it's to me quite ironical that the opposition uh, to such a facility tends to come from religious fundamentalists uh, who seem to have forgotten about that wounded man on the road from Jericho to Jerusalem, uh, well described in the parable of the Good Samaritan. And so I think that's beautiful policy. It saves lives, improves uh, amenity, and tells people who are marginalised and vulnerable that they count, that their interests are important to the community. And you need one in Richmond, and get out there and argue for it. <laughs> uh, it's terrific to hear you give that example. I do not have a fetish for former premiers, but my guest on the Fifth Estate two weeks ago was Bob Carr on this issue. Right. Uh, so it's really pleasing to hear a, such a passionate and eloquent uh, follow-up on that. Um, if we're... Uh, not able, I mean, in, in Victoria, uh, if you can't persuade on the basis of medical and other evidence for a safe injecting facility, if we know the majority of Australians want uh, same-sex marriage but we can't get that, if we can't make our schools that little bit or a lot better in the cases that they need to be to lift our education standards to where a great nation ought to have them, 
uh, if we still have uh, an ever-growing underclass of people affected by the costs of living um, and all sorts of other problems. If we can't do a better job at those problems, um, does it become impossible to allow space uh, for just pure creative thinking, uh, let alone uh, just just the broader objectives of what a, a, a wealthy nation state should do uh, in terms of ideas. And I, I, I say that noting that I don't remember the last time Malcolm Turnbull said innovation. He seems to have dropped it. Get with the fashions. National security. National, national security. security. Right. Yes. National security. When We've had three tough. announcements on yes. national security in the last yes. week from Malcolm Turnbull. The one thing Turnbull. that was going really well. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, if you, if you have enough people mistreated long enough, um, getting angry long enough, you end up with uh, Donald Trump. Mm. I mean, it's not, it's not a random event. Uh, he, he, he isn't just an aberration. He is a direct product mm. of precisely the marginalisations, uh, the, the failures and the, and the political dysfunction and the anger that built up in America uh, for very good reason, for very good reason. Um, I remember uh, when, uh, after Trump was elected, the first time after that that I spoke to the, the American political scientist Francis Fukuyama, I said, so Trump, what do you think? And he said, I'm amazed it's taken this long for uh, the mistreated American classes to rise up. He said, I'm amazed. I thought it was gonna happen a lot sooner. It's a pity that the, that the concept of innovation uh, is so difficult to run in Australia. And I'm not just talking about the sort of thing Malcolm Turnbull was talking about with his innovation strategy for the economy, although that's, that's important. I'm talking about innovation generally. Um, and, you know, obviously my view here would be that in the, the late 90s, early 21st century, when John Howard was in power at the national level, people forget that at state level, there were a range of very creative governments uh, doing new things, new ways. Down in Tasmania, for example, Jim Bacon had this whole project to try and involve the people in the future of Tasmania, given the economic challenges that they faced. There, uh, we, we mentioned the injecting centre. There, you know, I could mention examples from my own state. Da Australia's always worked best when it's positive about itself. And I think... Um, the last time that was really in play in Australia was in that sort of build up to the referendum on the, 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 the Republic, which was defeated, as you know, uh, and uh, that we could go through that story as well. But, you know, the idea that we can, we can be different, that we can think about what we're doing, we can come up with new ideas to deal, with, like the NDIS, is, that is one example, actually, that was a, a new way of thinking about uh, public policy. But what is required here is a bit of thinking and I think one of the features of the modern political class that I do think is a valid criticism is they don't spend enough time reading and thinking. They spend a lot of time campaigning, which is all good, and I'm not knocking campaigning, it's important. But, you know, the, the post-war Bretton Woods consensus didn't come just like, you know, manna from heaven. There was a huge amount of intellectual work and thinking that went into it, uh, just as there has to be if you're going to get a good... Uh, you know, government in Australia. So a little less politics and campaigning and, and a little bit of thinking. And as I said, if someone does that and comes up with a package and then goes to the people with a few... And then, indeed, there'd be a few risks attached, I'm sure they would succeed. Good to see idealism alive. Well, <laughs> well I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm an idealist realist. Um, but unless you're ideal... Unless you have some sort of, you know, light on the hill, what's the point? Well, I think John Curtin used to take a walk every single lunchtime from memory uh, just to think alone. And was it Chifley who actually had a lie down <laughs> and a <laughs> cup of tea? Uh, Thinking is a very important part of good politics. It's rather mm. uh, uh, under It'll never catch on. It'll never catch on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I, I want to ask each of you about... Um, nastier forces, I suppose, that are, uh, may or may not be uh, changing or getting worse. So uh, 
the forms of political donations, for example, corruption, uh, but also the uh, influence, and I'm not sure whether this is increasing or not, it's always easy to feel that it is in your time, isn't it, something, but uh, the influence of unelected um, super wealthy people on policy. Uh, and I'm obviously thinking, uh, you know, uh, uh, Gina Reinhart, uh, the mining industry, and, uh, well, Clive Palmer for five minutes when he actually was elected, but you get my drift. Well, this is uh, um, one of the advantages of the rise of angry populism in the form of One Nation and the Hanson Party, is that it so frightened both the Liberal and Labor parties federally that they are finally getting around to making some of the institutional changes in, uh, in governance of themselves that people have long uh, cried out for. The Turnbull government hasn't, I think this is just by, by, uh, by default rather than strategy, they haven't broadcast them, but one by one they've been working through a list of, so for example, uh, parliamentary expenses. They've now created an independent agency uh, which is going to operate at arm's length of both political parties and the government uh, and, and investigate and review parliamentary expenses. Um, and there's a series of, of, of those measures that have either been done or are underway. Uh, the, uh, they've now, both parties have agreed this year to commit themselves, that they've committed themselves to this year uh, pass legislation to reform political donations, which is exactly what you're talking about. We don't know what form that will take because the relevant minister, minister for State, uh, special minister for state, Scott Ryan, says he's still trying to piece it together because um, what, this is one of those areas where, you know, the old saying money is fungible. It looks like it's simple. You just block foreign donations, for example, one obvious reform. It's amazing that Australia hasn't blocked foreign donations um, and that will uh, solve that problem. But if you look at two of the Chinese billionaires who's, who've had some pernicious influence on Australian politicians in recent months, um, one of them is an Australian citizen. Uh, so it would make no difference and he could continue donating and giving whatever he wanted to anybody on any terms. So you've got to say, oh, OK, not just foreign donations, you've got to broaden it and you keep going. So You so can't have dual citizenship. <laughs> <laughs> The light's going on collectively on that subject, isn't it? <laughs> but this is simply to say that the parties finally are committing themselves to addressing the problem. We don't know what their solutions will be, but they've said they're going to address them. We've even got the Labor Party in principle agreeing to the idea of a federal ICAC, anti-corruption commission, a permanent federal one. Um, the Liberal Party hasn't committed to it, uh, but if they continue to be as panicked um, by uh, Hanson, then maybe they'll get around to that too. But this is this is this is, is happening, and it is improving on our watch. See, they know they're loathed, don't they? All of these politicians. <laughs> oh, you bet. Well, they, they, do, they, they do not know. completely that way, though, and Sally. They're not actually loathed in that sense. I mean, I think there's a deep. I think I think there I think there is actually, Jeff, a, well, a sense of such widespread disrespect that... No, 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 there is wide bit, but I'm trying to make the point here that from an... You think of the individual MP and their constituency, I mean, they would... Most of them would work pretty hard in their electorates. They'd have a lot of support from people for the work they do. But that's not the point. But I, I think the point is that there's a generalised feeling that the outcomes of the system are predetermined by the powers that be, which is your point. And in that sense, uh, you know, there is, a, there is a feeling out there that we need to reform. And Peter's right. Uh, the whole question of political reform, uh, reform in the way that government works, the way it's subject to accountability checks, etc. At the Commonwealth level, when I was first into politics, the Commonwealth was leading the way on everything. You know, it was, it was the great reform era of Australian politics. And for some reason, it's, political reform has died at the national level. Uh, Griner had his uh, uh, corruption commission back in the 80s. Queensland had it. We got one in WA. They've now flowed through to the other states. But nothing has happened at the Commonwealth level. And, and I think, you know, I come back to my point. I think at the, com at the national level in Australia, there's a thirst for something new, uh, which is a total package of measures which will really mean something for people in terms of the future. Uh, but someone 
and one of the two parties has got to take a risk on that. I suppose a lot of the small L liberal types in our community thought Malcolm Turnbull would do that when he came in, but he's obviously decided to, to work, you know, as he has to, I guess, in his own party with the, the forces, conservative forces within. On the Labor side, well, you know, they're, they're very good at managing politics and it looks as though they're going to win the next election. But what I'm trying to imagine is, is how will that government address these big social, economic, environmental and political issues that we need to now that we're in a completely different world, which we haven't talked about, a completely different world where the thugs are winning, you know, and, and there's more, uh, you know, except for Europe, which is waving the flag as best as it can, although there are exceptions, we find that progress is being held up. And so we need a much clearer concept of where we fit into that world, I think, than we're getting. Uh, well, let's talk about that before we throw to questions about uh, what is happening in the instability in the world and the uh, perplexities of that. How does that impact on an already slightly weird situation here? Well, the, of course, um, Australia hasn't, we think we have, but we really haven't felt the experience of the rest of uh, the, mm -hmm. the Western world. Uh, but the, the last time there was a, a a big economic dislocation in the 1930s, it produced European fascism. Uh, this time we had the 2007-8 economic collapse, which we in Australia call the global financial crisis, the Americans call the Great Recession. Um, we don't yet know how that's going to play out. Uh, we can see some of the manifestations. So, uh, you see Trump, uh, and he's not going away, he's not going away. Um, one of the American stand-up comics the other night, you know, had those, those late night comics on TV, he said, um, uh, well, it looks like this, uh, this latest event could be the beginning of the end for Donald Trump. He said, oh, wait, that's, the, that, that's, that's old material from a stand-up monologue I did a year ago. Mm. Uh, people have consistently written Trump off and he's, he consistently uh, amazes uh, that he was able to get there and that he's, he's still there and that he's still got 85% approval among Republican mm. voters. Um, so uh, he's not addressing the underlying concerns of the people who elected him. He's not addressing the white, middle, white working class uh, inequality, economic suffering, uh, lack of services and opportunity. He's not addressing that. Even, even if and when he goes away, the underlying phenomenon will not. The US is in a lot of trouble and we shouldn't expect political solutions or leadership from the US for a while. Uh, Europe is a complete mess. Macron got up because um, uh, well, turnout in the French election was something like 38%. It was the lowest um, on record. Um, when, rec when turnout's that low, anything can happen. But there's a lot churning still in Europe. Uh, we, we, look at, um, we look at our own region where there's a, 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 a rising uh, nationalism unchecked by American power, uh, whether it's the Chinese, the Japanese, their rivalries uh, recrudescent. Uh, we live in a, in, a, in, a very, in a very troubling time uh, and here in Australia we really don't have, in the scale of, in the scale of other countries' problems, we, we have small problems that we like to talk up as big problems, but really... Um, so uh, what would be the really smart thing for us to be doing right now in that sense? <sighs> In, in which sense? In the sense of what you've just described as going on in the rest of the world. Oh, oh, well, we should do what we should have done a lot earlier, of course, which is establish a more independent sense of ourself in the world. Uh, you know, the old deputy sheriff uh, concept really is very old. <laughs> it's a very old story. And you don't want to junk the alliance because it's still a national asset and it can still produce useful, useful goods, right? Um, but... Uh, we cannot look or expect uh, to the US for leadership. We certainly cannot r rely on uh, Donald Trump in a crisis. Look at the way he's treated other allies. Uh, we would be nuts to assume that the US would rescue us if we got into any serious difficulty. We need a much more independent view of the world and of our own standing in the world. And that's pretty scary for Australians. Mm. Look, I, I think in answer to your question, Sally, um, I feed off what Peter's been saying and, and agreeing with largely with what he said, is that I think the one really, we, just to get some really good government in Australia that's clear 
on you know, the, the needs of its population in terms of the challenge of climate, uh, the needs of its population in terms of the clearly demonstrated inequalities that now exist in our health and education systems, such that you know, the great Australian concept of the fair go really is not materialising at all. Uh, that cleans up its political system in the ways that we were talking earlier, that involves the people more through new institutions like, you know, using citizens' assemblies on some key policy issues. So to make a better community uh, that's, that's more united around fairness, equality, democracy, I, I think in and of itself that would be a great contribution uh, to the world. I mean, if we just look at some of the, the challenges that are, that are faced economically and we look at some other nations in the world, and you do go, for example, to the Scandinavian type thing, you can actually see there that this real concern about having not just liberty but equality, having a proper social support but also a very strong economy, you can do it. So I think Australia, as a response to the international things, ought to get its own act together and show to the world that you know you can be a very, very uh, democratic, fair society, even with all of these challenges going on. Because the, the risk, I think, is that as people get more cynical about these things, as, as it becomes, it seems harder and harder to resist the, uh, you know, the embrace of authoritarian and even you know fascist type regimes that might surround you, that you start to compromise. And before you know it, drip, 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 you know, your own society starts to reflect those values. So I think a good government really committed to Australia being a social model, a political model for the world, is something that we can do that would really help in terms of the troubled times we live in. If you've got a question, please put up your hand and uh, start speaking when a microphone's put in it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello. My question relates to the chatter I've heard in the press recently about um, the fact that compulsory voting in Australia has something to do with the dire situation in our federal parliament. And I'm just wondering what you think about the idea of getting rid of compulsory voting in Australia. Thanks. Peter? Uh, I was ambiguous about uh, compulsory voting until I lived in the US. Um, <laughs> When you, because uh, Americans won't have a bar of it because they consider it to be communist or socialist or something like that. Um, but when a minority of a minority can produce uh, an, a, a national political outcome, uh, it's obviously, well, it can be disastrous. Um, our country has, I mean, Jeff's making the point that Australia is not uh, not good enough on equality or fairness, um, and there's room for improvement. But look at countries. Let's use the US as an example. Um, here we have relatively boring election campaigns. We have earnest debates about tax rates and, and and mortgage interest rates and things, because everybody has to turn out. So it drives the debate, and the political debate goes to the central. Uh, concerns of the mass of the people. In the US, the trick is to get people off their bums to go and vote on a Tuesday, remember? It's a Tuesday, a work day. Uh, and to get turnout, that drives the parties to the extremes because you have to activate people by pushing the so-called hot buttons and you get nuts policy. You get extremist policy. I mean, look at their guns policy, uh, for example. You get uh, elections run on extreme, extreme policy appeal and that produces much worse outcomes for uh, anything to do with equality or fairness. Uh, it has, mm. it's, it's much more damaging uh, to the long, in the long run to the fabric of a country. And I've become, uh, as you can tell, a, a convert to the idea. I think it's a way of keeping the country together, of keeping centrist concerns and the, the concerns of the bulk of the public rather than a section of the public foremost. And I think my response to Americans who said, oh, look, it's communist, it's socialist, you could never do that. My response to them was, well, hang on. We all agree that you've got to pay tax as a civic duty, just to keep things running. We just define civic duty as including turning out once every two, three, four years uh, to a polling booth as being part of your civic duty. Mm. I think I, it demonstrates Australia's difference in a way from America. 
that, that one issue of compulsory voting, that we're saying that you have an obligation, a duty to participate in your society through a fairly simple mechanism. You don't, you can still vote informal. I remember reading a ballot paper once, one of Kim Beasley's elections when I was scrutinising it, said, beam me up, Scotty, no one down here is uh, bright enough, which was, <laughs> but I think it demonstrates, it demonstrates Australia's commitment to working as a community. And in that sense, we are different from America. And uh, uh, my fear is some of the bad elements of America are sort of creeping into our, our, our practices. So, no, I, I'm totally uh, against uh, changing that system. And I think it's, it's really indicative of, of what we ought to be, a community where everyone can work together to solve problems. And if you say that you don't necessarily have a role in that because you don't have to vote, I think that's, that's immediately taking you down the track to what we've seen happen in America. I think that is so rosy to say Australians are more committed to their community than anyone else, but... No, no, their system I, says I, they should be. But um, the system yeah. makes them, and what we are is a very obedient mm. people, and, uh, and it, that's a good thing. I mean, I would lie down in front of trucks to save compulsory voting. When Barack Obama left Australia for the first time, he was asked, I think as he was getting on Air Force One, what did you love the most about Australia? And he paused and he said, compulsory voting. <laughs> uh, and uh, I thought that was a great answer. Hi. Um, how would four-year compuls... Um, four-year terms of government help with implementation of policies. I feel like most, particularly um, coalition governments, are just waiting for an opportunity to go to an early election, so nothing much ever really happens. Thanks. I'm not sure it would have a huge impact. I'm in favour of it, by the way. I think we should have four-year terms. Um, but I, I'm not sure it would have a huge impact, but it's something we ought to do. I used to think it was a great idea until it was introduced, uh, well, it's now, it's common in the state, it so is, it was introduced yeah. in New South Wales, for example. Did it make any difference to the quality of the governments of New South Wales? None whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> the ones in place at the time the reform was introduced were just as terrible. Some of the ones since have been better, worse. I've come to the view that it just gives them another year <laughs> before we get to have a say on it. So I've gone from being a firm believer to now being, being a sceptic. I don't really think it makes a major difference to the quality of government. I think that depends on other factors. Theresa May may have put a bit of a halt to contemporary mucking around with uh, early elections. So perhaps we'll at least get our three-year terms uh, for a little while. Next person. Hi, I'm going to ask a rather unpleasant question. Um, I sometimes wonder if Peter Harcher, I uh, know with deep respect, I think you're a good journalist, but if you're living in some sort of fantasy land, say Obama, uh, if I, when you say politicians are loathed, I think that's true. And I, when you look at, say, the way we've behaved with Iraq, with the war on terror, I would call that thuggery. Now, if you're an African, you would probably end up in the criminal court for that. Uh, Barack Obama was probably one of the more violent presidents. We're going to need a question, Okay, please. the question is, when does public morality and legitimacy meet actual reality? Are we believing we're so much better as a Western concept when, when we look at our behaviour in the last 20 years? I see delusion. It's a hell of a big topic. Mm. Very briefly, I'd say I thought the, that Australia joining the US invasion of Iraq was a profound error at the time, and I wrote that. Um, I thought it was a, a shocking misjudgment, and it's proved to be, that's proved to be so. But the, the larger question you raise, we could have a whole seminar on that. Mm. Yeah, I think that, that there, is, that there are values related to... Uh, you know, compassion, which we might say come from our Christian origins and more specifically about human rights that come from the Enlightenment, that have been demonstrated to produce a better type of society for the people uh, under, in the societies to which they're applied. And, and I think that is important to, to, uh, to keep those values foremost in our thinking. I lived in France recently for some time. Liberty, equality and fraternity, last week, 14th of July, of course. Uh, 
And to have those values up there, it doesn't mean that everything that happens in France is good. Of course it doesn't. But it's, it's a, it has, a, has an impact on the way people think. What does it mean to say liberty, equality and fraternity? So the society has immediately... It's talking about those things. Now, we have a constitution which has a few elements in it, but, but not a lot. Some elements that are very, very good. Um, we don't have a Bill of Rights, of course. We don't have a Charter of Rights, even. So I do think that our quote-unquote Western, if you don't like that terminology, you might say Enlightenment values, they are important, and, and I do think we should educate around those. We should have a public morality around those sorts of things. And uh, it's, it's a much better way, it's a much better form of glue for society than the sort of rather empty nationalism that we get and we did get, I think, from the Howard years. Uh, it's said that in the next 20 years, uh, many millions of jobs will be lost due to the rise of artificial intelligence. Many see this as a coming catastrophe, but I think that it should be a bonanza, and I think that it is taxation policy which would make the difference. Do you agree? Well, the profits the, of uh, disaster and destruction, you can always see what's going to be lost and destroyed. It's like the protectionist debate we had in Australia in the 80s when Hawke and Keating tore down uh, the, the tariff wall that we'd sheltered behind for a century. You can always see the bits that are going to, are going to suffer and, and, and be destroyed. You can't see or imagine uh, the sectors, the growth and the industries which don't yet exist. That's exactly what happened uh, in our experience with protectionism. Keating's response, Keating was, was, was asked, you know, what do you say to the workers who lost their jobs because of your policies? He said, I, I say to them, how do you like your new jobs? <laughs> um, how many of us want our kids to grow up working in factories? So uh, now that's, that's sort of a philosophical position about change and industrial change and having faith in the ability of uh, market-based economies with productive, creative people to come up with new industries. Nobody, nobody foresaw that Australia would have, that our third or fourth biggest export would be education to the world uh, and that health services would be such a booming, would be such an enormous booming sector. Um, tax policy, well, it's, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on how it can make the difference, but I think I'm running out of time. He might have been implying the, uh, the basic income uh, concept, you know, universal basic income. The, I, I think it's interesting when you, when you ask this question about what will the future bring. The great uh, academic uh, management guru Peter Drucker used to argue the future's always with us and you've just got to find out how it's working. And he, one of the ways he did that, he used to be fascinated by prizes who was winning prizes, and it usually indicated where the innovation's coming. Mm. Now, automation is absolutely now fundamental to work, and many jobs are being shed. We've seen it not just in manufacturing, but also now uh, in the services sector. One alternative is to say, give everyone a, a basic income, and uh, you know they can enjoy leisure and, and whatever. I, I'm not sure about that. It's being tested, I think, in Finland, in the Netherlands. They're trying some pilot projects. But where is the future? The, the Drucker quest. I think it, we can see it. Uh, the needs we have as a community, all of the, 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 the uh, health and education systems, ageing of our population, uh, this is where the jobs are happening, as Peter just pointed out, in terms of health and education as economic activities that have marketplaces not only in Australia but around the world, but also as a social need. So I, I think we've got to ask the question, where are the jobs going to come from? And the government has to take an interest in the answer to that question. Uh, we've got all of the new technologies associated with uh, energy, et cetera. That's one part of it. But I think an increasingly important part of it would be to get more people working in the service industries that really matter, such as health, ageing, education. You know, we can always do better in those areas, and, and doing better is partly going to mean putting more resources and more people to work uh, in that area. So I think automation, yes, it is happening. I don't think we should just say, oh, well, the new jobs will come somewhere. I think government has to take more interest in full employment, uh, and, and that interest can be reflected, I believe, in more service-type uh, jobs that are creating a better type of society, and that will mean more government. Not necessarily delivering those services, but certainly funding them. 
If that's just an old-fashioned argument of socialism, so be it. <laughs> Uh, what a note to end on. Uh, I don't know how to feel after, after, after that, uh, but I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Gentlemen, mm. thank you so very, very much, Jeff Gallup and thank Peter you. Hartcher. Pleasure. Thank you. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world. 